We will be starting the recording shortly. Please prepare. Welcome. The Institute for Evidence-Based Care is pleased to sponsor today's webinar, Innovations in Heart Failure at Meridian Health. Our program is not supported by any commercial funding, and our speakers have no declared conflicts of interest. This webinar, as always, will be available for viewing for at least the next six months for Meridian employees via the webcast website. It is available 24-7 throughout this time. We will announce this availability on the intranet as it becomes available next week. Please encourage your colleagues to complete the webinar. We will not have time for questions today, but if you do have any for our experts, please send them to the Institute or post them to the WebEx site, and we will ensure that you receive a prompt response. Educational credits are available for both nursing and medicine. You please read the accreditation statements on this page. Realize that in order to receive these credits, you must complete the separate evaluation program form and fax it with your contact information posted to the Institute for Evidence-Based Care at 732-776-4837 unless you are already in a group session. We will restate this at the end of the program. The learning objectives for today's program are that we will describe the current best practices for heart failure disease management across the continuum and describe outcomes that may be associated with these best practices in heart failure disease management. Our speakers today are Dr. David Boss and Dr. Vincent de Bono. Dr. David Boss is Vice President for Clinical Effectiveness and Medical Affairs for Southern Ocean Medical Center in Manahawkin. Prior to joining Meridian, Dr. Boss was Vice President and Associate Medical Director for Health New England in Springfield, Massachusetts. He is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame with a Bachelor of Science and received his Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He is board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. Dr. Vincent Vivona is an attending physician with Brooks Cardiovascular Specialist. Dr. Vivona is past Chief of Staff of Ocean Medical Center and current Chair of the Department of Medicine there. Having obtained his bachelor's degree from Hofstra and his Doctor of Osteopathy degree from the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences in Des Moines, Iowa, he continued his education by completing his JD from Temple University School of Law. He actively practices both medicine and law. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine. And without further ado, I turn the program over to Dr. Vivona. Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the innovations that we are instituting at Meridian really uh, revolve around the concept of disease manage management. A very uh, concise definition, uh, a comprehensive, integrated approach to care and reimbursement based on a disease's natural course. There are a number of driving forces behind this concept that uh, lend it to a validity of being used in, the terms of, uh, in terms of managing disease, especially on an outpatient basis. Chronic disease is everywhere. Households with chronic health conditions, 45% uh, say that they have a family member or members that have a chronic health condition. Uh, 53% say that there is no person in their household that has uh, chronic health condition. As you can see, there's a uh, substantial number in the household that have chronic disease, and essentially the direction of treatment uh, in the future will be uh, based on uh, that fact and in terms of coordinating care. In 2003, 80% of health spending went for 20% of people in the United States. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality estimates that 70% of healthcare spending is for treating chronic diseases. So, if any efficiencies in healthcare spending uh, and uh, delivery would really be mostly directed at, uh, at treating uh, chronic disease. We have had a tremendous growth in technology and information systems 
which allow us to bring the uh, follow-up of patients uh, from the hospital uh, very directly into their home. We're able to uh, use certain uh, technologies, for example, the interactive voice response technology, which can uh, deliver information to us from the patients who are at home and thereby able to give them more direction in that, resp in that respect. In the past, this, once the patient was discharged from the hospital, there was really a disconnect until uh, they visited their physicians. Uh, in the concept of disease management, they, uh, in, in 1967, the American College of Pediatrics developed uh, a concept of what they call patient-centered medical home. And this is really where the, really where the, the chronic disease management is, is really going to be centered for us, so to speak. Uh, the patient-centered medical home is an approach to providing comprehensive primary care for children, adolescents, and adults. The patient-centered medical home is a healthcare setting that facilitates partnerships between individual patients and their personal physicians, and when appropriate, the patient's family. Since 1967, uh, the patient uh, medical home has been uh, redefined has been redone, and in 2007, a conglomeration of professional societies representing over 330,000 primary care physicians came up with the uh, principles uh, for a medical centered home. And these principles very briefly included, of course, the personal physician, which really this centers around. It was it's totally physician directed medical practice. The physician takes the lead role in coordinating uh, the patient's medical care. The uh, medical care is really directed at the whole person and where the professional uh, private doctor would use some specials, et cetera, for their treatment if needed, along with coordinating that and discussing that with the patients themselves. Uh, the coordination and integration of this care is very important and it really is the heart of, of, the, of the concept, and which is where we really want to involve the patients in their own care and hopefully educate them and, and, and even actually have them call their own shots in some of the aspects of care so that we can really reduce uh, uh, you know, their readmissions to the hospital and hopefully for a better outcome, obviously. And that's the second, the last, the last part of the, of the equation is, is quality and safety. Uh, the American College of Physicians introduced evidence-based principles into the medical center home. And the, uh, this hopefully includes en en enhanced access and also payment uh, would be based on, on, on the aspects of the medical center home. So really, this, this is going to be something in the future. It's going to be interactive with what they call accountable care organizations. And this is going to really be where the action is going forward uh, in the care of, uh, of chronic diseases. Inform consumers and the need to improve outcomes as part of that medical home concept is we have the chronic care model in which uh, there's an in a integration between community and the health system. And this is where our pilot program, really, uh, which Dr. Boss will address later, uh, really was emphasized. We needed an informed patient uh, interacting with a prepared, proactive uh, practice team. And the major issue is contact, uh, communication, uh, making sure that we're lining up certain things for the patient. And if the patient has any questions, we really uh, interact with the team also to have some input into his own, into their own treatment and management. Hopefully, what this accomplishes is improved outcomes, where the patient is not just discharged, left in the home, with no interaction until they see their primary care doctor. And our pilot was very successful in dealing with this aspect in terms of the chronic care model. Healthcare is changing, as we all know, with the new uh, Obamacare. Uh, things will be very different going forward, and uh, one of their linchpins is the uh, accountable care organizations. I won't be able to go into that in detail, but these uh, organizations will be delivering uh, care to 
patients, and really the medical center, the medical center, patient centered medical home will be a part of, the, of a good core of what that delivery would, would be and be defined as. In terms of uh, more specifically the management of uh, heart failure, we have the Heart Failure Society of America, which has come up with recommended components, about eight components, uh, for a heart failure disease management program. Uh, as you can see here, we need comprehensive education and counseling of individualized patients' needs, promotion of self-care, very important, including self-adjustment of diuretic therapy in appropriate patients with a possible family mem member or caregiver assistance. Emphasis on behavioral strategies to increase adherence. Uh, very important, vigilant follow-up after hospital discharge or after periods of instability. Uh, this is where a lot of times things go wrong. The patient may go home for two days, gain 20 pounds, nobody knows about it. We need that vigilance to really prevent readmissions as well. Of course, optimization of medical therapy is important, and that would center around the, the patient as well as the uh, personal physician. We want to make uh, it definitely an increase in access to providers, and we always would like to make sure they have an appointment with their physician within a reasonable amount of time when they are discharged from the hospital. And of course, to be educated in the early signs of CHF, including fluid overload, shortness of breath, slowing of the extremities, et cetera, and other uh, social issues that may need to be addressed. Patients who have been recently hospitalized for heart failure and other patients at high risk should be considered for referral to a comprehensive heart failure disease management program. Uh, again, this does have evidence that it does reduce uh, readmissions and also improves uh, outcomes very strongly. Teaching uh, is very, uh, very critical. Teaching is uh, not sufficient without skill building and specification of critical target behaviors. Take a pulse, take your blood pressure, uh, know what, what other uh, symptoms may be there that might be uh, leading to destabilization. This is very important for the patient themselves, and we teach them how to use the equipment they have and to uh, actually monitor themselves uh, as much as possible. And it's very important, and, and we really can't just do it once and be done with it. It's a, re it's a continual reinforcement of the patient to do this type of uh, follow-up with themselves, very important. It's recommended that educational sessions begin with an assessment of current heart failure knowledge, issues about which the patient wants to learn, and the patient's perceived barriers to change. We like to address specific issues. One of the biggest, of course, is med medication non-adherence uh, and the causes and why. Is it the cost of the medicines, failure to take the medicines, fear of side effects. Also, uh, behavioral changes are very important, especially in, in dietary habits. You know, they should know that they have to uh, limit their diet in terms of sodium uh, intake and, and understand that uh, that can really destabilize them, especially if they are in an advanced heart failure state. And really to look at what motivations we can give them to uh, to try to accomplish these things. And, and again, that's where the interaction and the coordination is very strong. Looking at this, and it's a meta-analysis and a review of heart failure disease management randomized controlled clinical trials, looking at this, all steps of this show that uh, there is a re re reduction in hospitalizations, 50% uh, reduction with follow-up with a cardiologist, 37% with home visits, and actually 24.7% reduction with telephone follow-up. As Dr. Boss will address in the pilot program, we saw those some of those numbers come down with the follow-up that we did have uh, after they were discharged from the hospital. Uh, but it really sh goes to show that this interaction, this follow-up, coordination really does make a difference in, in the chronic diseases, and as we have here, especially in heart failure. This New England Journal of Medicine article, which was published in April 2009, reported 19.6% of Medicare beneficiaries were readmitted within 30 days. 
significant. 19.6% we admitted to any DRG, whereas 10% estimates of planned readmissions, estimated cost to Medicare for that was $17.4 billion. Patients were most frequently readmitted was congestive heart failure. On the uh, horizon is the reduction in payments for readmissions. So this could significantly impact income not only to physicians, but to uh, hospital systems. Very important point that has to be tackled. The readmission rates are also published in hospital compare, so they are available to the uh, general public. The Meridian experience, which again is our experience, the uh, rural hospitals there in our uh, system. Uh, CHF is the most common DIG across the uh, Meridian hospitals the most frequent reason for readmission. Between May of 2008 to April 2009, 1,700 acquired admissions for CHF DRGs, 159 cases readmitted for CHF in 30 days, 9%. Readmissions more than expected. Average length of stay for readmitted cases greater than the index admission, and CHF is also a significant contributor to length of stay of patients readmitted from another DRG. So the CHF rears its ugly head all the time in, in every aspect. Uh, Meridian developed an OMC CHF pilot project really with Dr. Boss and, with, and, and myself there with Dr. Boss was the uh, uh, main man. And basically uh, it involved our case management team, Meridian Home, technologies that were introduced by uh, Meridian, we did have a uh, scale, we had interactive voice response, which were able for us to manage over, over the phone and not necessarily have to go into the patient's home. We had tremendous nursing education for the patients. A new position was created, program coordinator. We got the Institute for Evidence-Based Medicine involved as well, and of course the uh, financial aspects of it. And that pilot program encompassed all those aspects, and I believe uh, Dr. Boss will be going into that in more detail. The Ocean Medical Center patient population, more specifically where we did have the pilot program, 97% of inpatients served by OMC are from Ocean and Monmouth counties. In 2010, there were 58,108 patient visits to the emergency room and 6,081 admissions. Heart failure admissions are among the highest diagnoses. Ocean County has the largest population of older adults in New Jersey and the second largest in the country. In 2010, 58% of all OMC admissions were seniors over the age of 65. Key components in, the, in, the, uh, in, in our program included to make sure that there was a physician follow-up for the patient when upon discharge. And in this instance, the, the appointment was made uh, for the patient. We had home telemonitoring. We had that inter interactive uh, voice response. We did have scales available. And that helped tremendously in, in monitoring the patients at home. These uh, technologies are new, they're, they're being introduced over the, all over the country. And I think as time goes on, it'll be just a matter of doing business in, in chronic disease management. Patient education. Patient education is very important. I, I spend time in my practice educating patients because they, they really appreciate it. And you know, you would tell them, well, if you have a brief little night cough, you might have a, a small amount of heart failure. Oh, I didn't know that, just, you know. So I mean, you tell them little, little uh, uh, pearls of what they should expect when they're home if indeed they might be getting uh, going into a destabilized uh, situation. We developed a very nice uh, or, or have available to our pages a very nice booklet called the Comprehensive Heart Failure Patient Education Booklet, PERC for short. Uh, the advantages of this is it has very good descriptions including a, a glossary of terms uh, address is more importantly both right and uh, left heart failure because we do have a number of patients with COPD. Uh, eating out section 
is particularly helpful in that it provides sample menu choices for these patients. Uh, it's very comprehensive, but it's very simply written, not overwhelming at all. Uh, there is bulleted details in the book as well. There are website references for the patients, which are provided. Uh, sections on coping and support and advanced directives are helpfully provided. And these, these booklets actually generate more questions for the team uh, when they, after, these, after the patients do read them. They, they generate a lot of questions. But it's a very good educational tool, and we're going to be using this uh, at Meridian. Ongoing contact from Meridian at home is important, and uh, uh, a very good uh, team. I, at times, may get some calls from the from the team. Uh, the private doctor is also kept in the loop at all times. And if there's any problems, there, there would be call, calls to the private physician. Uh, the disease management program director actually directs this and uh, on all the ongoing uh, contact. And it seems to be uh, working very well. It's very successful. And I think they're, they're very, very busy in that aspect. Early stepping stones. Uh, physician involvement is very important. And it's very important that we familiarize ourselves with the evidence-based guidelines that are used to provide the best care. When the patient at home was initiated, the, the ACP, Medical College of Physicians, was the organization that really introduced the concept of evidence-based care to that uh, disease management model. Uh, it's important to know that the decision-making, and, and I said this before, that the decision-making is retained with the attending physician. There's no attempt to... Uh, to take that management away from the physician. The physician will know if the, if the patient's having problems. The physician will know if, indeed, he's having a problem with medication, fluid retention, and uh, our team does notify the doctors of, of any problems that may be resolved. The most important concept that it takes a team to do this, we have an excellent team at, at Meridian. The OMC team is, is very good, and it has been a very successful program. We've had buy-in from all the cardiologists. There was initial skepticism, but uh, it really now has full participation from all the cardiologists. And it's a very successful program. Hopefully, it will be extended uh, to the other uh, campuses. So really, the, the information is available for uh, patient uh, care, for the patient the medical home. Uh, I think that uh, in the future, more, more uh, redesign of the program may, may come about, but for now, I think we're really on our way uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, using uh, disease management in uh, congestive heart failure. And now, I am going to turn the program over to uh, Dr. David Boss, who has been very instrumental in this uh, uh, attempts to, uh, to coordinate this uh, very, very much so. David? Uh, thank you, Dr. Vavona. At this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend some time uh, describing a little bit more of the pilot project in detail. Now, when we originally envisioned the pilot, we had gone through and uh, researched the evidence that was available, and we first then identified what the pilot population would look like. So the first thing that we wanted to do was establish our inclusion and exclusion criteria. First being that we wanted to include those patients with CHF as a reason for admission to the hospital. What we did was we developed a report which was generated every day and would be sent to the case management department at Ocean Medical Center. The case managers would then go forth and identify the patients to see whether they fit the, uh, the parameters for inclusion into the pilot project. And then they would hand it off to the pilot project coordinator. Um, we, once we established that a patient had CHF, we did want to include uh, patients with any New York Heart Association classification of uh, the severity of their illness. We did accept patients with active comorbid conditions, as many of them did. 
And we did identify we wanted to focus on patients that were being discharged home or home with home care services simply because those patients are the ones that are the, that are the farthest from a health care provider and health care support. Patients that are discharged to a SNF or a long-term care environment typically have more support than those that are going home. We excluded patients with a history of cognitive impairment or no caregiver willing to assist the patient at home because obviously one of the cornerstones of a disease management program is patient self-management. We uh, excluded patients that were discharged to rehab or skilled nursing facilities, again, because we at first wanted to focus on patients that were discharged home. We excluded patients discharged to uh, non-Meridian Health home care services, simply because they were out of our reach. And finally, we did exclude patients with end-stage renal disease who are on hemodialysis. The reason being that that the, the daily fluctuations in weight, in weight and fluid status as well as the rigors of their hemodialysis were really too much to, to add to the pilot program. Our target uh, for participation was a total number of 60 patients. We divided them into two arms. One arm was patients being discharged home alone, and the other arm was 30 patients being discharged home with home care uh, and we use the remote at-home uh, technologies for this arm. And our timeline was a 90-day pilot project period um, for the patients that were enrolled. We then established uh, two tracks for the pilot participants. And again, in just to reinforce uh, one of the points that Dr. Vavona made, one of the hallmarks of the project was that we wanted to make sure that we weren't interfering in any way with the patient-physician relationship. We wanted actually to reinforce the closeness of the patient-physician relationship. So one of the hallmark aspects of the program was to establish a follow-up visit with the patient's primary caring physician, that could be a primary care physician or a cardiologist, and because our literature review demonstrated that the outcomes for patients were better if they were seen by their physician within two to four weeks after discharge, we made sure that everyone before they left the hospital had an appointment within two weeks with their physician. Now that is a little bit more than, than meets the ear. Uh, it takes quite a while to get that done with arranging for rides and family members and appointment availability. So that was something that we handed off to the project coordinator to do rather than to have the hospital nurses take care of that. So with that being said, the two tracks were the patients being discharged directly home, and those patients had uh, a 90-day period of uh, telephonic prompting using an IVR system or an interactive voice response system. That's a program where a computer will call the patient and ask them questions. Those questions will prompt them about taking their medications, following their weights, and also symptoms such as shortness of breath or swelling in the ankles, and also dietary adherence. It will prompt them as to, to remind them about those aspects of their self-management, but also it will also alert us if the patients had an abnormal response. For example, if they were gaining too much weight, then that would trigger a phone call from a nurse, a, the pilot project nurse that was monitoring the program would then reach out to the patient to find out what was going on. And each of those elements, depending upon what the response were, would develop a, a, a response from the nurse. If it was a severe issue, the nurse would call the patient and, if necessary, contact the physician or get the patient into the physician's office. In this way, we were trying to avoid uh, ER visits or uh, readmissions to the hospital. For the other pilot track, these were patients discharged home with Meridian at Home uh, nursing care and remote patient monitoring that monitored uh, vital signs as well as weight. Uh, we again assisted them with getting their follow-up visits 
and used HomeNet or Intel Health Guide technology to track their vital signs and weight for a period of 30 days. During that time, if their weights changed or their vitals changed, then the pilot project nurse would then reach out to the patient, take a history and find out what the issues were, and intervene before the patients got into any more trouble. After that 30-day period, they completed the 90-day pilot project period with 60 days of the IVR automatic prompting system. Looking at the number of patients that we screened, we, we identified during the 10 months of the pilot project from February through December of 2010, we originally identified 685 patients that were admitted to the hospital with CHS. 491 of those were not candidates for various reasons, including being discharged to post-acute care settings or based on clinical criteria. Of the 194 potential candidates, a number were not put into the program, the most common reason being patient declination. The original physician declinations died down uh, due to the hard work of Dr. Vavona, who reached out to the physicians, gave them a call, uh, spoke at various department meetings, and generally reassured them that we weren't trying to steal their patients. We eventually enrolled a total of 78 patients, 31 in the uh, Meridian at Home with at-home technology monitoring arm, and 47 in the IVR um, in the IVR arm. Now, we never had any delusions that we were doing a large, um, multi-centered trial with a statistically significant number of patients. We knew that we were a pilot project and that we, were, uh, we, we never intended to have enough patients to have statistically significant outcomes. However, our outcomes were pretty interesting. What we wanted to do was we wanted to measure readmission rates within 30 days for patients being admitted for any reason or patients being admitted just for CHF. If you look at the graph on the slide, the upper line are patients that are being readmitted to the hospital for any reason. Now, this is a larger group, and the, you can see that the trend line for this group trended downward. Keep in mind that our pilot population was pretty small, and it, it may not have accounted for the dip in trend line. The trend line could have been affected by Hawthorne effect or some of our general education uh, that we were doing at the same time, but it was still pretty interesting. If you look at the lower line, and these are patients being readmitted exclusively for CHF, you'll see that the trend was even steeper downward. And this, we believe, really was related to the work that we were doing with the patient population. And it's a very interesting and very consistent trend line going downward. So despite the fact that it's not statistically significant, we thought that it was at least qualitatively significant enough to move forward with, with future programs. Looking at the next slide, you look at all of the patients that we interacted with and how they did in terms of readmission rates. The pilot project patients did the best. Both arms of the study had no readmissions within 30 days at all. The patients with the IVR had a couple of readmissions at 60 days, and the remote monitoring patients had no readmissions at 60 days. Interestingly, the patients who either declined or were not candidates for other reasons had significant rates of readmission within 30 days. So again, it's not statistically significant, but we declared victory nevertheless. If you look at the next slide, again, one of the most important aspects of the program was to make sure that the patients followed up with their physicians and were seen within 14 days of discharge. And as you can see from the results, we had a significant uh, number of patients that had their follow-up appointments and were seen by their physicians in time. 
In terms of uh, future directions, you know, a lot of the essential program aspects are, are pretty routine for uh, disease management programs, patient self-management and participation in the program. But we also introduced some new and unique at-home monitoring devices. We also focused on physician follow-up and made sure that we uh, continued to reinforce the uh, patient-physician relationship and made sure that the patients followed up with their physicians both routinely after discharge and if there was any sign or symptom suggestive of uh, worsening of their condition. Telephonic care management was really the backbone of the program because whether the patient reported some symptoms through the IDR process or were identified as having changes in vitals or weight through the telemonitoring process, the, the nurse in the background was able to interact with the patient and was able to intervene. And interestingly, we had a couple of uh, very good stories to tell, uh, the most interesting of which was a patient who was gaining too much weight. And when the nurse spent literally an hour on the phone going over their med adherence and their diet, found out that the patient really loved that rotisserie chicken that you can buy at the grocery store that smells so good. What they don't know is they put a lot of salt on it to help it taste good, and it's something that really tipped the patient over. Um, and with changes in their diet, they did better. We are already expanding this approach to CLPD patients at Ocean Medical Center, and that uh, process is undergoing is going on right now. And this type of, of process could really be applied in an accountable care organization setting. Although we don't know how these organizations are going to shake down, it's very clear that a multidisciplinary, a more global approach is going to be needed um, to, to provide care in the future. And in a clinically integrated network model or an ACO model, all of these um, the aspects of this program are certainly applicable. It's population focused, and many of the aspects that w of the procedures that we use cut across multiple chronic diseases or could be used in patients with multiple comorbid conditions. So at the present time, we're evaluating other possible pilot projects. As Meridian is, is looking at pilot projects in a clinically integrated network model at this time. Thank you, Dr. Voss and Dr. Bivona for a fantastic presentation today. For those of you who are interested, the OMC pilot extension into COPD is well supported by evidence as well. The disease management offerings for COPD are, are very well supported by large studies from the VA posted just last year. And we would be happy to share that information with anyone who is interested. Please contact the Institute for Evidence-Based Care for further information if needed. In the meantime, we ask you to please post any questions to the webinar itself and or call the Institute, and we will get back to you with our experts' responses as you post them. Again, thank you so much to Drs. Boss and Vivona for a fantastic presentation. Audience, remember, to obtain your continuing education credits, you must fax your evaluation form with your contact information on it to 732-776-4837. That fax number is 732-776-4837. Thank you for joining us today. Do reinforce to your colleagues that this, avail this uh, program is available 24-7 on the same site starting next week. Please hold the date also for our annual Institute of Evidence-Based Care Regional Conference. It will be November 29th and 30th in New Brunswick. Flyers are coming out soon. Thank you and have a great day.